up. Um, my name is John Overhide. I'll be talking about uh, probably some stuff that is different than the previous presentation. Um, if, if you uh, don't use Linux or haven't heard of GRSec or PAX or haven't read Exploit in your life, then this might not be the most interesting talk to you. Uh, it's going to be deeply technical. Um, but if you're willing to stick around and you'd rather see this than the European point of view on data security and privacy, uh, I encourage you to hang out here. I don't know, is that, I think that's what's going on in the other room. Yeah. In half hour, oh no, the keynote's there, so yeah. Um, this is a, a talk I originally did with my buddy Dan. Um, we both came to the same conclusion about uh, some exploitation techniques and uh, I'll begin it without him, but I might have a stand-in for Dan um, during parts of the talk. Um, and I encourage you to throw your shmoo balls or whatever they're ger gerbils, not balls, gerbils. I encourage you to throw those at me at all times to make sure I'm paying attention to you. Um, don't wait to ask questions. I hate that. Um, yell at me if, if you disagree or uh, you have something to say. I want you guys to be loud and rowdy. Um, someone, somebody requested a drinking game, but um, I don't have enough beer, so it looks like you guys don't either. We can get more. Yeah, I think Sean is supposed to bring me a beer here, but uh, it's slow. So I guess I'll get started. I have uh, 80 slides, so I don't plan on finishing the presentation. Um, but you know, if there's any side tangents you guys just want to talk about, uh, you know, I'm happy to not talk about the slides I have. Oh, here we go. We're still on slide one. Yes, the kernel hardware compromise. Um, there was a. A, a turkey that was, I heard, responsible for the uh, kernel.org compromise. <laughs> this was him uh, at the scene of the crime, defacing kernel.org with maintenance page. Uh, anyway, we're not going to be talking about kernel.org, uh, unless you guys want to, or linux.com. Oh yeah, yeah, I run a secure operating system, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, whatever, I guess. Ah, so, first slide. Um, if, if you do like Linux security, you probably won't like this presentation. Um, one motivating factor in all the work I do in kernel exploitation is um, Linus Torvalds, who um, has some interesting views on security. Uh, this was a quote from LKML where he was talking about um, sort of the security circus that we're at right now. Um, saying that, you know, normal bugs are the same as bugs that have security impact, like an availability bug has the same impact as a request, and therefore we should treat them all the same and not classify them differently. Um, he's of the belief that they're all bugs and they all should be fixed. And at some level that's true, but, you know, you're not going to get owned by availability bugs, but you're going to get owned by everything else. So, um, Upstream uh, mainline kernel has some very interesting attitudes when it comes to security, not only reporting bugs, but also trying to take um, exploit mitigations upstream as, as near as possible. Um, so while you might like Linux's operating system, if you're running a normal distribution, you're probably uh, pretty damn insecure. Uh, the other motivation was our, our good friend, uh, Spender Pratt, who uh, he, uh, is the author of uh, GRSec. Um, and he had a, a blog post, he likes to write angry blog posts very often uh, about, I forget what this one was ranting about, but at the end he had a, a call out to all these conferences that usually have this line of like exploitation presentations must be against GRSIC PACs in their CFPs, and then there never are presentations. Um, I think partly because people don't care about GRSIC PACs because it's not widely deployed, um, but also because it is somewhat difficult to exploit. How many of you guys uh, just in the audience have deployed GRSec or PAX on your Linux boxes? One. Yes. Stand up. Round of applause. There we go. Yeah, so it's not widely used, um, even though it can provide some additional hardening uh, for your Linux kernel and also for user space uh, exploit mitigations. So uh, first thing I want to talk about was an overview of Linux kernel security. Um, or lack thereof. Uh, if you look at the kernel vulnerabilities of uh, Linux over the years, um, the past decade, you can see 
things have been ramping up uh, fairly dramatically. Uh, 2005 was was pretty bad. I think that was around the time uh, 2006 was released. And there was a whole bunch of just easy DOS bugs. Um, but if you actually break it down by severity, um, which is really the most important thing, you know, the red ones are usually the best or uh, information disclosure bugs. Um, this is just rated by the uh, CVSS score, which has a variable uh, accuracy. But um, in general, there's a, definitely an increase in uh, uh, serious bugs in the past the, the last 10 years. So, um, you know, this is grappling with 2009. If we actually look at 2010, uh, which was last year, there was a whole bunch of CVs assigned, um, much more than uh, 2009. And uh, interestingly, uh, most of these bugs, or I guess 43% of them, were discovered by uh, just six people. And this is when uh, uh, Rosenberg went on his, his, his rush last uh, year and picked off 47 bugs of varying severity. I'll put another couple other guys, Case and, and uh, Spender and uh, Travis Normandy, and a bunch of other guys, uh, lots of bugs too. So uh, 2010, there were um, 12 public exploits for uh, local privilege escalation. Um, most of these bugs turned out to be uh, sort of in exotic areas of Linux kernels. So you have a lot of packet families. You have like Econet, RDS, CAN, um, CAVE, ROSE. Um, all of these random packet families that no one uses yet uh, are still loadable into the Linux kernel by a privileged user just by requesting um, creation of a socket with that packet family. So um, some of these bugs were in the core, but very few were in the core. Um, some were in sort of distro-specific code. And then, of course, um, the two for Red Hat there are not only, it's not just two bugs that affected Red Hat, but there are two bugs that Red Hat uh, specifically introduced into their, their current. So they're bonus ones for Red Hat. They also have all the rest of them. Um, and if you break them down by impact, um, you know, most of them are low severity denial of service, which, you know, depending on your viewpoint, uh, availability loss could be big if you're at like a school with a multi-user system with like, you know, 20,000 students, but um, the ones you uh, really care about are privilege escalation. Um, we classify 26 of them that are pretty sure for us, and some of them that, you know, possibly if you work a while, you might be able to rank with some, some for us. Um, there's also one that's that's nothing. I don't know. That was stupid. It got a CVE even though there was no uh, possible chance of exploitation. <laughs> there was no impact whatsoever, but it was ready past the boundaries of the structure that was allocated in a bigger structure, and there was extra space, but whatever. Um, so there were some 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 fun exploits um, that myself and, and Dan wrote last year. Um, Bull Nelson was a fun one in the Ethernet packet family that combined three different vulnerabilities in order to get a, a null write, which once you have a null write, you can just clobber a partial overwrite of some function pointer and split privileges. Um, Half Nelson was one I, I worked on for way too long. Uh, the Econet bugs were released last November, and I just finished and released Half Nelson like a couple weeks ago, so that wasted way too much time on that. Um, obviously, I wasn't working on that the whole time, but it's a pretty interesting bug. Um, it's a, a stack overflow as opposed to a, a buffer overflow on the stack. There's a difference in terminology there. Um, so feel free to take a look at that if you're interested in stack overflows. Uh, RDS owned a lot of people. Um, where was RDS used? Probably, I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing RDS was probably used in the kernel network compromise. Um, a lot of these things get reused in pop on patch coxes, unfortunately. Uh, I can has mono hardened was a, a slug overflow that uh, um, using a technique that uh, Twiz and Scracker introduced way back when. Um, and my favorite was American Sign Language, which was a um, actually I had to write this exploit um, in ACPI, which is you know sort of your power management for your um, OS and BIOS. Um, they have a, a special language, uh, ACPI source language, ASL, and an ACPI machine language that's, that's compiled to and then interpreted. So my payload was actually written in this ACPI language, which was you know, way more about ACPI than I ever wanted to, to learn, but uh, it was a fun experience. So um, vanilla exploitation on Linux kernel is pretty easy. If you have an arbitrary write, it's game over. Um, even if you have less than arbitrary write, it's just usually game over as well. Um, there's a lot of different places that you can um, either influence the structures that are related to the credential management of your thread or process, or you can simply um, you know, redirect control flow by overwriting some function pointer or something else. 
um, controlling some data object, which then eventually results in control flow um, hijacking to a payload in user space. Um, on vanilla kernels, there's a lot of uh, info leaks available through um, chaos and slab info. A lot of information that helps make your exploit more reliable. Um, it's really not too hard um, on vanilla kernels uh, once you have a bug. Um, so what this talk is about is more about uh, hardened kernels, uh, being DRSEC and PACs, and um, what mechanisms they put in place to prevent this traditional um, exploitation um, model against vanilla kernels, and uh, you know how we can actually uh, work around some of these uh, exploit mitigations on DRSEC. So um, one guy used DRSEC, which is awesome. Um, if you guys haven't used GRSEC, um, you should at least take a look at it. I mean, give Spender some, Spender and Quebec some money for uh, uh, putting hard work into this. Um, they accept donations and new source of support contracts. So if you are a company that has large Linux infrastructure and cares about um, not having that infrastructure owned, it might be worth to invest a little uh, time or money into looking at GRSEC packs. Um, it is free, but you, know, you can pay for support if you want. Uh, Jurassic and PACs have these sort of high-level goals um, in general, both when looking at uh, user space exploitation, but also kernel exploitation. Um, they try to, of course, uh, prevent the execution or the introduce, introduction of additional uh, machine code into an address space. They try to prevent the execution of existing code out of order, um, similar to all of the rock garbage. Um, and they also try to prevent the execution of existing code in its original order, but with different data, which can often result in really desolation. That, that last one is a pretty difficult one, but uh, um, the first two are, are pretty well um, prevented in most scenarios by PACs. So uh, some of the features of GRSEC and PACs that are useful um, as far as uh, kernel land goes. Current exec, which is, um, has its similar um, counterpart in user space, prevents uh, the introdu introduction of uh, executable code in the address space um, by um, Marking a lot of stuff uh, that was previously rewrite or re execute to read only. Um, UD rep prevents you from easily popping back from uh, kernel land into user space. Um, so it prevents all user space query references, whether they're uh, data accesses or um, execution. Um, things like uh, SMAP from uh, Intel was just introduced in Silicon, uh, I think last year. And that only, only prevents uh, execution, uh, not data access. So UDRF actually covers more than the stuff that Intel builds into the chips. Um, HideSim allows you to uh, cover up a lot of the uh, info leaks that um, would be very useful if you're trying to develop a reliable Linux exploit. And ModHardin prevents all of these, you know, all of these exploits that I talked about here, which mostly rely on um, really old, unmaintained code in various random packet families that you'll never use. Um, ModHardin stops those um, packet families from being auto-loaded by a, a really cuts off a lot of the, uh, sort of attack service. So, uh, so uh, Dan and I came up with this technique we call stack jacking because um, in the infosec community, everyone likes hot buzzwords, and they always involve jacking of some sort. Um, fire jacking or fire sheep or I don't know. We thought it would be a, a, a great term to sort of mock the uh, terminology that people use. Um, and what this does is it allows us to bypass some of the um, exploit mitigation features offered by GRSEC and PACs. Um, and as I said, Dan and I both were sort of working in this, this area of exploitation and um, communicated privately and arrived at the fact that we both uh, come up with this um, same technique with a slightly different uh, model. So we'll go over, um, I don't know if we'll have time for, for Dan's techniques. If Dan wants to come to the stage to talk about them, maybe. So we kind of have this flowchart here of, of what we what, what primitives we assume um, we have from whatever bugs and all the steps we need to get to to gain read access. Um, it's a fairly complicated process, but we'll zoom right through it. I don't even know what time it is. Um, okay, we've got 45 minutes to cover a thousand slides. So um, the hard, our, our, our target assumption that we're making is that um, you have GRSEC and PACs enabled. Uh, one of you in the audience, I'm sure you have uh, GR current sec high configured, um, which really makes your system pretty unusable if you have like a, a, a desktop and you're running X or XOR. It um, does actually need to uh, turn off some features of GR sec packs just to run X. 
Um, but really, most of those those features are, are not as relevant um, to the, the kernel hardening. Um, so we're assuming that there's kernel exec, UDRF, HIDSIM, monoharden, um, everything that comes on the, the highest default level there. Um, we also want to make some uh, additional assumptions, um, partially because we, we can um, with our exploitation techniques. So we want to make a stronger challenge um, because some of these uh, assumptions that we're making might not um, apply in the future. So we want to make sure we're, we're sort of assuming the worst case um, and just trying to find the most generalized techniques to attack it. Um, one thing we're, we're assuming is we have no knowledge of the kernel address space at all. We have um, sort of no if we leaks to start off with no it's a completely black box, um, which also includes you know full randomization of the kernel text of data, which is not necessarily true, but we're um, assuming that. We're also assuming that this is going to be like a data only attack. We're not going to be modifying the control flow, and we're not going to be introducing uh, new code into the kernel address space to execute. So it's kind of hard, like just these two assumptions alone. Um, you have UDREF. And you're also assuming that you can't introduce new code in the kernel space. So you can't introduce code in the kernel space. You can't introduce code in the user space. You have to do a data-only attack. Um, so the first assumption we're making is that we have an arbitrary kernel memory write, um, which you know against a vanilla kernel, this is easily uh, game over. Um, it does sound like a strong assumption because you know if you can write anything anywhere in kernel memory, I think you'd be able to escalate privileges. Um, but in this case, no. You know, we're ah, <laughs> right on the ball. Nice shot. Was that nice one? If someone does that from further back, they they want a thousand dollars. Payable by payable payable by Sean. Sponsored by Terramark. Okay. Anytime you throw a ball at me, I'm drinking. Yeah, if we have a, uh-oh. Oh. 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 oh my gosh. I threw up my arm. That was a good toss. Um, so uh, yeah, we, even if we have a, a arbitrary kernel memory write, we can't really do anything with it because we have this whole black box, which is, you know, here's your address base. That's the upper um, above task size on this at least 32-bit. Um, you know, you don't know where to write. Where would we write? What would we write? We're probably going to crash the box and not do anything useful. Um, so we got to know. We have to know something. I mean, there has to be some sort of knowledge that we can leak from the kernel in order to target our arbitrary write uh, more properly. One way to do that is just with an arbitrary kernel memory disclosure. Um, there's been a few of these over the years. Um, a lot of times, you can dump a lot of kernel memory. It'll be like an unbounded copy to user, where you can just dump like you know megs and megs of kernel memory and pull out interesting addresses that. And then target with your arbitrary write, um, but you know these are somewhat rare. And even some of these examples in the past, you know, like uh, uh, the packet ready DVD stuff, um, SCTP, um, those two would be mitigated by all the mechanisms that uh, GRSEC packs already uh, put in place. So you know, they wouldn't even be valid. And we want something that's more common and more more general of a, a technique. So this uh, vulnerability class was. Sort of interesting because it was, it was sort of like the joke of um, kernel security or like the OSS stack list. Because uh, Dan was going through, you know, 37 vulnerabilities Dan found last year in the Linux kernel. I think the vast majority of them, at least 25 of them, were these uh, sort of silly bugs that um, were useful to fix. I mean, as far as like, um, you know, there they are bugs that are leaking some information from the kernel back to user space. Um, but people didn't consider them have any impact. You know, oh, you need some information, and it's not going to be any sensitive information. What we could possibly do with it? They got like the lowest CVSS score when they're actually assigned CVEs. Um, and what I'm talking about, of course, is kernel stack memory disclosures. Very exciting. Um, what happens with the kernel stack memory disclosure uh, requires a little bit of uh, knowledge about exactly how the uh, kernel stacks operate in Linux. Um, so unlike user space, you have a very, very small stack in kernel space, um, simply because if you're on a machine that needs to support a lot of processes, you can't have enormous um, stack size, or else you're going to have you know, no kernel memory left. Like for example, on 32-bit, on you have one gig of kernel memory dedicated to you know, your entire machine. If you're using you know, anything more than a page or two for each process, you're going to uh, 
I'll very quickly run on memory. Um, and in Linux, you have uh, most commonly an 8K stack. Um, sometimes uh, there was some efforts to do 4K stacks um, for uh, machines that um, really had uh, pressure of a lot of processes and very limited address space, but you know, 64 bits is sort of uh, unnecessary now. Um, so it's just a pager to your entire um, kernel stack, and this has to, of course, you know, contain your entire call stack, which makes system calls, subsequent calls within the kernel, and their stack frames are you know, stored on the kernel stack there. So a kernel stack memory disclosure is leaking some of that memory that was stored on the kernel stack from you know, stack frame, from system call, um, and that actually gets copied uh, you know, incorrectly or leaked back to the user space. And very commonly, this is from like uninitialized field in the structure. So you're defining like a structure on a, a kernel stack. For example, you have like you know struct foo in this hypothetical system call here, and that foo has you know a few members bar, weak, and bas, and you happen to assign two of those members, and then you do a copy to user the full size of the struct. Um, you're actually you know hypothetically, if there was some sensitive data on the stack in a previous system call. And in your next system call, you actually you know you reduce the same stack. It's not like cleared on every system call or anything. Um, and that you know foo dot leak happened to overlap sensitive data when you actually copied that full foo structure back to user space. You would then leak whatever information um, was on the stack previously. Um, so for this example, when you copy back to user space, you'd be leaking you know four bytes um, of the the kernel stack contents uh, through this this member back to user space. Um, of course. Uh, Dino Daisobi, um, aka Secure Tips, uh, has, has very useful information when it comes to uh, uh, keeping memory uninitialized. It's a very safe technique. Um, so we, we have our uh, primitives, and we're going to show how we can use these primitives to actually exploit a, a GRSEC kernel. Um, so there's not really, uh, as I mentioned, there's not that much useful data on the kernel stack. <coughs> Usually, um, in the Linux kernel, there's very limited use of um, you know, a stack in general. So if you have a small stack, it's only two pages. And they have very efficient um, sort of dynamic memory allocators, the slab, slab and slab allocators. Um, but there might be sensitive addresses on the kernel stack. And those addresses um, might help inform our arbitrary write in order to um, escalate privileges. So you know, in, in theory, there could be a, a pointer to, say, a cred structure which determines your processes, um, you know, privileges, and your, your UID, and so on. Um, so if we were able to leak one of these credential pointers off the stack, you know, we could simply use our arbitrary write then to write to that position. We found the address of the structure, now we can write to that structure, and that's what privileges. But really, that's sort of a, a very specific attack. You need a, a, you know, a, a, an exact overlap of, you know, a cred pointer on the stack, and having a, a uh, stack disclosure vulnerability that, that overlap that exact area of the, the stack frame. So it's it, it could work in some scenarios, but it's just really too specific for our needs. Um, we want something um, that's more general because these kernel stack disclosures um, will have different sizes and different offsets um, how deep they are in the, the kernel stack. So you might have a, a disclosure that's like you know three bytes, and then you might have one that's like 92 bytes. So finding something that works regardless of um, what size or offset um, stack disclosure is important. Right? So, um, came up with this crazy idea to leak an address um, that is not only stored on the stack, but that value of that address is actually pointing to an address on the stack. Um, so if you have like a, a pointer that you uh, declare and that pointer is pointing to another, uh, the address of something else on the stack, that's what we're looking for here. And this is actually, um, pretty common, not only in the code, but also um, just the setup of, of um, the stack frames uh, um, within the kernel stack. We can find a lot of information that um, gives us an address that also points to an address on the stack. So using um, an address of this, this nature, we can actually figure out um, from our own process where our kernel stack is located. And we call that uh, case stack self-discovery. So you know, if we, can, if we have a pointer on the stack, this, this red area, this is what we're leaking back to user space, and that pointer actually points to the stack itself. Um, suddenly, we've leaked off, you know, it's this CDEF1234, we know that that is um, contained, you know, within our, our kernel stack somewhere, 
and then if we just mask it off with you know the, the thread size, um, we know exactly where the base of our kernel stack is in kernel memory, um, which can be very useful uh, as we'll see. Um, and this can be done trying to figure out you know um, what information is leaked back to the user space. You can either look at it manually and try to figure out you know make a bunch of system calls. You get sort of a, a variety. You get a sampling of different information for each system call that you're leaking back to the user space. And you can sort of derive um, what this kernel stack base is from that, or you can use this automated tool we wrote, which you know, sort of calls, you know, some calls randomly, and then tries to derive the kernel stack base just by looking at, um, you know, if we find enough confidence, we have enough values in common that this is exactly this is indeed a, a stack pointer, a pointer to something on stacks, as opposed to a pointer to somewhere else in kernel memory. Um, <coughs> So that's the, the first stage of this process is figuring out you know exactly where our kernel stack is in memory. Um, that gets us you know a, a very small uh, stepping stone in our in our process. You know it's no longer a complete black box. We now know um, the location of something in kernel memory, and we still have our, our arbitrary write. So you know in theory we can write anything to this kernel stack now. So um, the question becomes you know. Where, where do we actually write in this kernel stack, and what do we actually write? Um, there is a lot of, of course, um, you know, pointers to data within the, the kernel stack itself. Um, but you know, even if we were able to write to a particular uh, part of the kernel stack, we wouldn't really know um, what to do with it. If it was a function pointer, we couldn't use it because um, we'd have to write. You know, if we, if we overwrote a function pointer with a user space address and tried to pop. Um, control flow over to user space, we can't do that because of UDRF, and really we don't have much visibility elsewhere in the kernel, so we can, uh, you know, um, point to a function pointer at some other uh, kernel function either. So, uh, we still have to do a little bit of work. Um, there is some um, very interesting uh, metadata that's stored on the kernel stack on Linux. Um, you know, your stack grows down, and at the very bottom, or sort of the base of, of the, the kernel stack, depending on how you're looking at uh, the memory, is this um, thread info structure. And uh, thread info is used, um, it's, it's stored at the base of the stack to sort of have a shortcut, um, since it has uh, members that are very commonly used um, during the execution of a process, so it helps to be able to access it quickly um, just by masking off a uh, stack pointer and finding out uh, the address of this thread info. Um, so there's a lot of very sensitive structures in here. Um, there are some interesting targets, um, for example, um, the adder limit um, um, member of that, that struct defines um, where sort of the boundary is between uh, user space and kernel space. So if you overwrite that, you could potentially uh, um, you know, write, write into kernel memory. Um, restart block is a function pointer, but again, function pointers are not going to do us um, much good because we can't redirect control flow anywhere useful. Um, so we wanted to look at uh, the task struct, which is the, the very first one there. Task struct contains um, our credential struct for our process or our thread. So if we can actually modify the uh, credential structure, then we can escalate the privileges of our process with the data only attack, not having to modify control flow. Um, but in order to actually write to this structure, we sort of have to follow these pointers. We have to figure out what the pointer or what, what the address of task struct is, which is the very first um, member on the base of our stack. And then also within task struct, we have to be able to find the pointer to the credential structure um, in order to follow that, and then use our arbitrary write um, to overwrite our UID and GID and, and uh, uh, capabilities and so on. So you know we've 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 kind of been able to figure out what our, our plan of attack is here. Um, if we actually can read um, sort of the base of the kernel stack here, we can find our task struct, and then we can read the task struct to find our credentials. So it's very obvious that. You know, we need we, we have some uh, information leaked from the kernel, but we have we need to construct a more useful read primitive in order to read additional kernel memory to uh, to achieve our our, our goal. Um, so what we have is is our kernel leak, our, our kernel memory disclosure, and also a write. And we want to take these two primitives and then combine them into an arbitrary read. An arbitrary read will get us the capability then to to read those pointers and, and sort of finish off our attack. Um, by writing into the credential structure and you know, doing whatever you want after that. So um, we still don't have the middle period, uh, middle middle portion here. We have our self-discovery. We know once we get our read, we'll be able to do our stack tracking, um, but we have to do our stack groping first. Um, 
again, buzzword uh, city, um, probably inappropriate buzzword city, but uh, it's the only thing we could come up with. Um, so Dan came up with a technique, as I mentioned, I'll go through this uh, somewhat quickly, um, that there is a uh, adder limit member of this uh, uh, friend info structure, which is store on the base. And adder limit, um, sort of, uh, anytime you do a copy from user, copy to user, um, there's an access OK check in the Linux kernel. And access OK checks to make sure that, oh, if you're actually copying you know, to a user space, um, you want to make sure that you're actually copying to user space and not into kernel space. So it makes sure that you're not um, sort of tricking the kernel into writing to its own memory. Um, so if you change this adder limit, suddenly you can write into uh, kernel memory. And this is a sort of interesting technique because um, it, is, um, it is somewhat reliable, or more reliable, of uh, Dan's Rosen group technique, because there is a, a very static offset from thread info, making it very easy, uh, you know, easy uh, uh, address to, to write into with the arbitrary right, once you know the base of the kernel stack. So you say, I know the base of the kernel stack, and I want to go up, you know, like 30 bytes or whatever to add our limit, and then, you know, write a very high value so that uh, the kernel thinks that, you know, all addresses are user space, including its own kernel memory. Um, I guess it's a little tricky um, on PAX and, and, and uh, GRSEC, uh, simply because um, PAX UDREF uses um, segmentation on x86. Um, so you have to uh, sort of time this right, but um, it only takes a few seconds to actually commit a race, a scheduling race, and it's a very safe, safe race. You're not going to crash the kernel or anything um, to reload you know, the GS register to make sure that it has the proper or your overwritten uh, add limit value as opposed to the previous one. Um, now, one of the um, downsides of Dan's technique is that um, it does depend on this um, you know, thread info struct to be on the base of the stack. There's really no reason for it to be on the base of the stack. It's a, sort of a, um, I don't know, a, a ancient history of, of Linux that was stored there for, for performance purposes, making it very easy to, to access when it's necessary. Um, so, you know, the pros are that it is fairly uh, generic and simple, but the cons is that it actually depends on thread info being at the base of the stack. So, um, what uh, Spender actually did, um, I think it was like a week before our presentation, he actually was planning to get some preliminary patches to move thread info out of the kernel stack, um, simply because um, it was actually due to Tavis's uh, IP comp bug, the uh, deep recursion or, or infinite recursion uh, IP comp uh, decompression that he found on like, all the BSD kernels. Uh, Spender sort of panicked and said, ah, that could happen on Linux, so let's move for info um, off of the kernel stack and put it somewhere else, and store a per CPU pointer for info, as opposed to sticking it on the stack there, which makes a lot of sense. Of course, mainline should do it, but they never will. Um, so, you know, I my my overgrowth technique was a little bit crazier, um, which I, you know, we had, this is where Dan and I differed in our exploitation techniques, um, even though we both had the, the same idea. So I remember talking to Dan over email, and I was like, you know, how can we get an arbitrary read from this? Um, like, what if we clobber, a, you know, process this kernel stack frame while it's in a system call? Um, and Dan sort of gave me this, this look over email, like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, so that's what, that's what uh, uh, my, my overgrowth technique sort of focuses around. It's not actually looking at the metadata um, that's at the end of the kernel stack, which you know can be removed um, if necessary, but looking at the contents of the stack frames themselves. So you know when you make a system call, um, the call stack that the kernel's taking, you know, your user space process is done, craft control goes to the kernel, and the kernel is uh, creating stack frames. Um, on the kernel stack, we're gonna attack the, the data uh, within those stack frames um, itself. And our end goal is to actually get a read here. So how can we read data by writing uh, within a kernel stack frame? And you know, uh, you know, if you just think about it, with a write, normally you should be able to achieve a read, but um, it actually turns out to be uh, a little bit tricky. So uh, there's a couple observations we made. Uh, there's a lot of code paths in the kernel that will copy data to user land via, you know, the, the sort of the copy to user family of functions. Um, and there might be copy uh, to user functions that use a source address, so the source address is whatever they're copying to user space, that source address at some point during the system call might be placed, might be pushed onto the kernel stack um, by some code. And so if we can actually find the code pass that will push the source address of a copy to user call onto the stack, 
uh, and we know the offset where that um, address was actually pushed off to the stack, we can overwrite that, um, that source address when, when it's stored on the stack. So when it's put this on there, we can hit it, and then later when it gets popped back off and used in this copy to user call, we can control the source of the copy to user call, which means that we can leak you know, arbitrary kernel memory back to user space. So it's a little, little uh, complicated, and um, the tricky part is, you know, how we have a we have like a say a parent process that's trying to write into a child's kernel stack while that child is actually executing code, whether it's in user land or in kernel space. So how do we actually time this exactly so that when the child calls the system call, it pushes the source address of copy to user onto the stack, does some stuff, comes back and pops it off, we have to actually overwrite it within that very small window. So what we can do instead is actually find a system call that's going to um, push this register on the stack, go to sleep for an arbitrary amount of time controlled by us, and then wake up and pop the register off the stack and use it as a source to copy to user. Um, so we call these sleepy system calls, and it, it turns out there's a, a lot of system calls such as like nano sleep or wait for or wait get ye you can use to actually um, put a process to sleep. Um, and then hopefully one of these um, you know, one of these system calls meets our needs for um, then popping the register off the stack and using it as a source for a copy to user type call. It turns out that one of the um, wait ID functions, the 32-bit the, uh, uh, compatibility layer, actually does do this. So, um, you know, it has this structure that's on the stack, um, the R uses structure. It will put the process to sleep, um, and at some point, the address of this um, R uses structure will be pushed onto the stack so we can overwrite it. And then later, after the process wakes up, um, it uses put compat our usage to copy from you know that that source address back to user space, um, and we can uh, control the copy to user and leak our um, sort of leak a, a arbitrary amount of kernel memory. So we, we, we sort of constructed a arbitrary read from our arbitrary write in our kernel stack memory leak. There's this big process. There's this very um, complex um, flow which has very horrible implications for our jacking and groping um, names because it's all about like parent and child process, like parents groping the child, and it turns out to be very, very horrible. We should have done better names. But, so that, that actually completes our, our uh, sort of, um, our overview. We, we use our um, kernel stack self-discovery to figure out where the base of the kernel is. We use our arbitrary write and our um, kernel stack leak in order to get an arbitrary read. And then once we have an arbitrary read and arbitrary write, we can simply read um, our thread info and our task struct and the address of our credential structure and overwrite um, the credentials of our process um, and display our privileges. And I don't think I have the VM on my laptop for a live demo, but um, it works. We have the code out there if you want to play with it on your own system. Um, for the one guy that runs GRSec, if you want to try this out. Um, I guess it depends on when you last updated GRSec. People who use GRSec and PACs tend to think that they're not, uh, they, 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 they can't be hacked, so they just never update their kernel, so it usually doesn't work out too well. Um, but, so, uh, I guess I got 20 more minutes, so we can talk about some of the, the fallout from this, which is uh, sort of the more entertaining piece, depending on your um, point of view. Um, you know, we gave this presentation at HES um, back a few months ago, and Spender wrote a, a pretty angry um, blog post. In our, in our HES presentation, we had, you know, proposed some of these fixes. Um, you know, Spender and Impacts are way smarter than us, so, you know, they can figure out what mitigations are necessary to, to prevent this type of attack. Um, but, ah, this is so small. Spender wrote this really, really long blog post um, about how we're horrible people, and, um, you know, I really respect Brad, so it was, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was not unexpected, but um, we were upset that he was that angry about it. So, um, I encourage you guys to actually read this blog post um, and, and just the JRSEC blog in general. Spender has some good rants about you know, computer security in general, and, um, particularly around uh, exploit mitigations. Um, so, as part of this uh, blog post, um, they rolled out some, some some good fixes to some of our techniques that we we proposed. One was uh, you know they moved thread info off the kernel stack uh, completely, which you know was more in response to the Tavis's bugs, um, but it was also 
um, hastened by, um, I guess, our, our, the Rosen Grove technique that Dan came up with. And also, uh, Fax made Rand K-Stack um, work on 64-bit. Uh, so Rand K-Stack's an interesting feature that on every single system call, your kernel stack pointer will need to start at a different offset. So um, my overgrowth technique, which you know requires us to um, sort of write in a particular offset to hit um, some save register um, on the kernel stack, um, makes it very difficult because every system call is going to be at a different offset. You never know exactly what that offset is, so you're sort of writing blindly in the kernel stack. You're probably going to crash in the process. And they had some other um, improvements to um, uh, access uh, user copy uh, functionality to make uh, any sort of um, copy to user uh, information leaking much more difficult. Um, so they sort of killed this entire middle section here, uh, which was our, our stack groping, which allows us to construct the arbitrary read from our arbitrary write and our kernel stack memory disclosure. Um, and that made Dan and John all very sad. Spender, uh, uh, Called our technique dead and, and uh, thought we were actually screwing him over, um, even though that was not the intention. All right, Rocky needs another picture here. Send them to Spender immediately. <laughs> um, so, you know, this next jacket really dead. Um, in its current form, maybe so. Um, but, you know, there actually is a, a slightly, uh, slightly different technique that. You know, I, I sort of alluded to um, previously, you know, I was talking about um, we could possibly screw all this stuff in the middle and just leak um, very specific addresses off the kernel stack. Like I mentioned, like, if you could leak the address of the credential structure directly from the kernel stack and not have to worry about all this broken garbage, um, you could simply overwrite your credentials immediately. Um, and we called this out as being too specific of, the, of an attack simply because you'd have to make sure that your kernel stack memory disclosure actually had the exact offset of where this uh, cred struct pointer was on the stack. So, you know, it was very specific and it might only work for some kernel stack disclosures that are very large or have to have very uh, particular offsets. Um, but what we realized is that this RAND case stack feature, which was, um, you know, sort of expanded to this orbit to help mitigate our attacks, um, here, which you know randomizes the stack pointer on each system call, um, actually makes exploitation of these type of um, conditions much much easier. So you know part of the fixes they rolled out actually made the problem um, a lot worse or a lot simpler for um, exploitation purposes. Since now we have you know let's say we have the stack frame um, for some system call and there's a sensitive data at some offset that you know an arbitrary offset on the kernel stack. Let's say that's the our, the pointer to our credential structure is actually in that red box there. Um, even though we only have like a static um, uh, kernel stack memory disclosure, say you know normally it would just leak where who got leak is at, at that offset. Um, with RAN K stack, suddenly on every system call, you have a randomized sort of start of your stack frames. So you can call this a bunch of times, just keep calling on these system calls, and eventually you're gonna get an overlap um, since this offset is, is randomized. Um, on every single call. Damn it! <laughs> so eventually you're going to hit, uh, you're, you're gonna find your sensitive data, you're gonna find your uh, credential structure. Um, it sort of uh, exacerbates the problem. Five minutes. Ah, oh, shit. Uh, it makes the problem of, uh, of, of a kernel stack memory disclosure uh, much more severe. It's not just uh, a leak of four bytes, it's a leak of pretty much the entire stack frame of how much data you want to read. So, um, so you're sort of in a, in a, in a uh, tough place here. Um, you know, you have a, you have a, uh, you can use RAN K stack, um, you know, get a cred or whatever the hell that means. Um, but if you don't use RAN K stack, then you'll get an overgrowth by me, so. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a tough trade-off. And uh, that was our stack checking 2.0. Um, so, uh, I have like no time left, but um, Pipax came up with some really cool stuff which uses uh, GCC's um, plugin framework. So you can actually uh, write a plugin for GCC such that when you're compiling a program, 
you can actually run code that operates on like the capable representation within UCC of your code. Um, so he wrote some really crazy stuff that will actually do um, what we mentioned here as being sort of crazy. He actually clears the entire kernel stack between system calls, which you know can be pretty expensive depending on how much you're clearing. But he uses these GCC plugins um, to make it a little bit more reasonable. For example, you only need to um, clear as much of the kernel stack as you use. You don't have to clear out the full two pages. You know, you can just do um, however much actually needs to be cleared. Um, so that actually goes about and um, stops the attack in a more general manner, but. You know, it is um, a feature that's similar to like PAX Web Sanitize, which you know most people probably don't use. Even if you configure your GRC kernel with you know GR current sec high, PAX Web Sanitize isn't enabled simply because um, of the performance constraints around it. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Maybe the performance will be reasonable, but you know people might not be willing to pay like a ten percent penalty um, just to prevent against these kinds of attacks. So um, you know, stack checking wipe the bottom. And that's it. Thank you, guys. Just ask a question about something. Yeah. <laughs> Who was next for Duo? Oh, there we go. That's a good question. I can pimp Duo while I'm up here. If you guys are in the need of some awesome two-factor authentication, check out duosecurity.com. It's pretty sick. Um, if you want to see a demo, come up here afterwards, and I'll show you a, a nice, nice live demo of our two-factor. We're a local company, and we do the best factor around, so if any of your companies are looking to replace RSA after they got owned, um, we won't get owned. <laughs>